Seemed like I was just here not very long ago. Well, or you guys stay on my mind a lot, one or the other. So, thank you. It's been a, it's a real delight and joy to be here and spend time with Pastor Gary and Jason. And, and I always look forward to, to being here because I get to hear what the Lord is going to say. So it's, it's a time that I get to take notes as well. So here's the entire of my notes. <laughs> <laughs> Wrote these down this afternoon, and I and I, I I really hear the Lord challenging me with something. I can sermon, you know, as Pastor Jason would tell you, you can, we can preach sermons. We can give things that we're just going after and after, and we can do it by routine. But for me, I have to believe what I'm saying is a present word, a now thing, in order for me to feel, you know, the the weightiness of the Lord. Can you turn me down just a little bit? <clears throat> so I may want to, there you go, thank you. So with that, I, I was asking the Lord something, and I, when I landed, coming into to Dayton, uh, Justin picked me up, and so I had this verse of Scripture heavy on my heart, and Jason, I, I, he, got to have to, he had to listen to me on the trip all back over here. And it was out of Isaiah 46, verse 10, and the Lord said, speaking, this is a kind of a, a metrome of God is saying, and the Lord God knows the end from the beginning. We've all heard that verse of Scripture. But I heard him say, I want you to start at the end and work yourself backwards. Okay? What does that mean? <clears throat> Most of the time we start at the beginning and we work ourselves the end. In the beginning, we know the crisis and we're hoping for the end. So we started at the beginning and said, oh me, what are we going to do? How things are going to work out? If it doesn't do this, I got plan A, plan B, or, you know, whatever. And we go to the next step. Okay, well, I guess I'm going to trust God. After all else fails, I'll pray. <laughs> then we go to the next step and saying, I hope God hears me. And then you get other people to pray. And then you go to the next step and say, God, or I'm looking for, you know, confirmations, you know, uh, some fleeces, several fleeces, you know, UPS showing up with, you know, something there showing me, oh, this was God. <clears throat> but what if we started at the end, and by the Spirit, you could see how things were going to end up, God intentionally, because I realize there's sometimes things end up not the way God intended for them to. But they end up based upon what I kind of guide them towards that. Girl one time said, um, she said, I have a, a guy that I want to marry. He doesn't know me yet, but I feel like it's God's will. So she was just making herself out there, you know, showing, getting in front of him and asking, talking to him and all that. I mean, she was doing the pursuit. And then I talked to her a year or two later. She said, that wasn't God at all. Well, you're married now. So now you have something that maybe God didn't intend to, but it was what you planned. So not all plans are necessarily how we, God intends for it to be up. So if we knew the end from the beginning and we could see what God wanted us to see, and all things work together for good to those who plan their own way and get their own right and direction and throw a fit until God finally says, all right, you got it. <clears throat> All things work together for those who love God. There's another part, and called. The word called doesn't mean have an ordination card in your pocket. Called, it means an opportunity to follow him. That's what call means. Many are called and few choose. The word they say chosen, but it's actually the original says many are called, but few will choose. We're all called, but not everybody will choose him. So if that's the way he wants us to go, then all things work together as long as I'm operating in the calling, which is to follow him, called according to the extent of his purpose. <clears throat> well, what was his purpose? First, first John 3, I think verse 8 says, for this very reason, the Son of Man was manifested that he, so he would destroy the works of the devil. So the mission plan, if you were, of the church, you and I, body of Christ, we're going to get on the family business, and that is to destroy the works of the devil. So destroying the works of the devil doesn't mean I find demons and just cast them out. I mean, they show up, we do that. 
But it's really the fact is when Jesus was feeding the poor, he was destroying the works of the devil. Healing the sick, he was destroying the works of the devil. He was loving on people, he was destroying the works of the devil. So it's, it's, it's going after the very Christ likeness to where that called according to his purpose, then he works all things according to that extent. So what I, I really want to get into tonight, I think by the Holy Spirit, is that for us to see the unseen, we have to think the unthinkable. Yes. <clears throat> Somebody write that yes. down. I may yes. want that later. <laughs> I may want to preach that somewhere else later. I don't know what that means yet. To see the end from the beginning, to see what I need to see, I have to start thinking beyond what I see in the natural. As one thinks in his heart, so we become, we become what we behold. We're in a world now that was constantly bombarded with, uh, you know, internet, outside, inside, on the phone constantly. I was sitting at the airport next to a lady waiting to catch a flight, and, and she was on her phone, I was on my phone. We didn't know what to do. We were shoulder to shoulder. And she said, what do we do before phones? And I said, I guess we talked. <laughs> She said, I'll send you a text. (laughs) So we're so aware that we, our thinking is bombarded continually. I was looking at something recently, uh, there was uh, was the big ad agencies in Madison Avenue, Fifth Avenue, whatever they are in New York, they're known for that. And they said there's two or three things that you can sell anything. Number one is fear sales. If you don't get this product, you'll be ugly the rest of your life. How many of you don't go out and buy a bottle of that right now? Too late. Yeah, right. <laughs> Too late. Well, there's always miracles. One time. <clears throat> or the fact is sex sells. You need this and you would, you know, you're really the greatest thing since anything. So all of those things are sales. And so they're made to distract or appeal to some part of our personality or nature. There's a verse of scripture in John the 14th chapter that we quote a lot, and recently as just today, I really, the Holy Spirit's saying, you quote that, but I don't know that you know what it means. It's nothing to get rebuked right before a meeting by the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Whatsoever you desire when you pray, ask in my name, whatsoever you desire in my name, I think John, John 14, 13, there it is up there. Man, you guys are quick. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do so. But the word whatever there caught my attention. It is, there's the Greek word that doesn't say it entirely like this, but we go back to a, a Latin definition connected with that, if that makes a whole lot of sense to you. It means whatever, and our, what we think is whatever. In other words, I don't care. Just, where do you want to go eat, honey? Uh, whatever. I said, okay, let's stay home then. (laughs) Well, no, that isn't what I was meaning. (laughs) Because that means I'm cooking. (laughs) Well, you said whatever. No, whatever other than what I don't want to do. So whatever in that that word there means to the one nature of. So we put it like this, to the very nature of his name, I will do it. So it can't be like whatever you want to do. Whatever you want to do, God, I'm good with whatever. When you pray, what's your, when you pray, believe that you have it. Well, if I, whatever, I haven't believed on anything. But that whatever comes to that point by the nature of the name that I'm asking. So whatever the nature, the nature of Jesus, you will ask according to that nature. Revelations 2 says, talks about Jesus' name. Now, if I said Jesus... I'd have half, half the Hispanic county want to show up. Jesus. Jesus. El nombre de Jesus. So well, the issue is that, but in Revelations 2, it says on his thigh is his name. It didn't say it's tattooed, it just, it's on his name. <laughs> on his name is called the word of God. When you put that together, he's saying, by the nature of him who is the word of God, you will ask what you will want to. So whatsoever we ask is framed and based upon the word of God. He tells us, here's what I respond to. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will not only be with you, but shall be in you. He will take of mind the word of God, Jesus, Jesus, 
Take a mind and give it to you. He is held to the Word of God. And so the Word of God is settled in heaven forever and ever. Every jot and tittle be fulfilled. So with that, we understand that whatever is saying, if you come into the nature and understand his nature, you will ask according to his name, the word of God, and it will be done you. So the idea of seeing at the end of the beginning, and we're going to pray over this tonight, how do we see something at the end of the very beginning? It is filtered and framed through his name, which is the word of God. So for a person to be a seer doesn't mean you're an Old Testament character that comes out of the desert once a year and, and says something to the king and he gets threatened to kill, be killed for it. But a seer is one who actually is, is seeing through the filter or the lens of the Word of God. The church world, I think, and people in general, I would say, we're under the gift of suspicion more now than we're under the gift of discernment. I have so many people that I was just dealing with a uh, lady in my church recently, and uh, she was saying, I have the gift of discernment. And she started telling me two or three people that were not, she didn't like. <laughs> and I said, you are discerning, not from the gift of discernment, from the gift of suspicion based upon the woundingness of your own heart. You filter everything through, and she had a lot of rejection. And I said, you'll be upset with me when I tell you that. If that confirms it. She was afraid to confirm it because she didn't want me to be right. Anyway, she sent me back and she said, I repented the Lord for not seeing people the way that he sees them in the image that they were created to be. Therefore, I was creating through the image that I had, that I had been my life in. And she said, I, I repented for it. Now I can hear the Lord with a much easier, with clarity. So if the Holy Spirit is wanting us to see what he's doing, then that means everything has to be framed with a sense of the word of God. What are you doing? What are you saying? I can't be operating out of my suspicion or just out of feelings. I, it, this feels awkward. This feels you know, bad or this doesn't feel right. There's a lot of situations I've gone in that didn't feel right because I'd never been in there before. Only what feels right is the one that I've felt before and I agree that it's okay. It's past the, my test, but it feels strange going there. I was up in New Jersey not recently. I never preached in New Jersey. I told Diana, I said, it just doesn't seem right <laughs> for me to go to New Jersey because I have had things said about people up in New Jersey. And I was told that people in New Jersey didn't like people from Texas. I went into that with a mindset framed that we were, they didn't like me and I didn't like them. It just didn't feel right. So I said, God, I don't, but I had to go. When I got there, I had to repent for my attitude towards people from New Jersey because God moved in a powerful way. So my point is this, to be able to see what God wants us to see, I have to clear what I've always seen. All right. Everything that is invisible, or excuse me, everything that is visible started with the seed or beginning of what was invisible. Everything that we see began in some way in the invisible world. You agree with that, Pastor? Amen. When you look at the, uh, take corn seed, you're looking at corn seed but the invisible world of that is a whole field of corn, not just eight ear of corn or one seed. So when we look at something, we know that it was before, it is now, but it has somewhere to go. Paul makes a statement in Romans 8, and he said, um, neither height nor death or all these things will be able to separate us from the love of God. And he said, nothing of the past, he didn't say the past. Things present and things to come. He doesn't even talk about the past. So, Paul, did you miss something? He said things present or things to come. How we step into the present determines whether we enter into what's to come. People get locked into the past, so much so in the past, 
that they never step into the present. So there's so much in the, my parents did this to me and I was a lonely child and they didn't take me, you know, and never got a Christmas card, never got that, so therefore I'm stuck. You heard people rehearse the same old, same old for 20 years. And they're wondering why there's nothing happening now is because they're stuck. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So somewhere or another, he said, things present right now and things to come. How we embrace whatever the present tense of your life is now determines how you enter into what is to come. Fear right now can stop you from entering into what God has designated for you for things to come. Fear can stop you from making decisions what God is leading you to and things to come. So I want us to look at how we deal with the moment whether it releases in the future. Case in point. Jesus comes into the town of Bethany with uh, where Mary and Martha lives. You know the story. He comes into the house and Martha greets him. She's happy for him to be here. She's now the the hospitality host, and, and so Jesus goes in, my, my, my imagination, he's sitting in the living room, and Mary comes in, sets at his feet. We know that much. Martha sees what Mary's doing, and it offends her. Because Martha says, thinks of G- Mary, you're not responding the way that I am responding. So because you're not like me, then I'm upset with you. Yet Jesus says, Martha, you're, you're so troubled about so many things, and all of them have an importance or expedient, but there's one thing, and it, it's important, and it will not be taken from Mary. Here's the point. Jesus was present. Martha was present. Mary was present, but only one person was presenced. You can be present and not be presenced. For instance, when they call roll in high school, call my name, I'd say present. But I can tell you there's a lot of times I wasn't really there. (laughs) My body was there, but my mind was somewhere else. I was thinking about sixth period when the bell rang, and I was hitting them, getting out of there. How many times are we present in church, but we're not presenced? Seeing and feeling and sensing his presence, therefore I become more like a Martha. I'm attending to the issue of a life, or I come, there's nothing wrong with this, I come to church to get my needs met. We understand that, that's quite understandable. But if we're going to see the end from the beginning, God, everything he does is to reveal himself. Ultimately, that's what he wants to do is reveal himself. If all I'm doing is revealing myself, my stuff, my pain, I'm stuck. But if I'm looking to see his presence in the midst of the problem, then I'm moving towards the end of things and working backward. And Psalm 1611, in his presence, there's what? Fullness of joy. Joy is not an emotion. Joy is an anointing. It's the joy of the Lord, not the joy for the Lord. For this reason, he's talking about there in Psalms 45, he's talking about his son, because you've had iniquity and love righteousness, therefore the Lord has anointed you with the oil of gladness, or joy, same word. Oil of Olay works too. I, I think I, it, it can, you can Greek it out some way, I'm sure in there. There's that beauty treatment I was talking about. So joy is part of the very nature of who he is. So Whatever, or by the one nature, we ask something with the name of God. So part of this preparing us to see the end from the beginning is to have this infilling of joy because that's the lens that I see it through. But if I get stuck in the presence is, man, this is, you know, how bad it is and nothing's working out good. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares. I've created a filter that I can't see his presence. All I can see is my presence and what other people feel, think, and all of that. I'm locked into the present, and I can't get to the future. Somebody will write and do a movie like Back to the Future. (laughs) 
So in his presence, there's fullness of joy. So when Jesus was with them, Martha was present, but his presence was the part that, he, that Mary chose and wanted, to, and wanted that ministry for. If we don't understand that being present is not enough. There was nothing in heaven saying, well, they were present today. They got a gold star. They made it. You know, we, I went to church. I got a gold star for showing up on Sunday. And there my name was on the board, and I had a bunch of gold stars. I don't think I'd get them in heaven. I just got them there with them. I didn't even get an honorable mention for that. But if we understand to be present, step into his presence, there's fullness of joy comes, then I can start asking according through the lens of the word of God, and he'll do it. But if I'm asking out of fear, asking out of, out of need, and certainly we have to break through those areas, out of just a neediness, God, I'm needy, and here's my needs. God never responds out of needs. He always responds out of faith. It's without faith it's impossible to please God. And say without any needs. A lot of needy folks. But faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So not seeing it is evidence that you're seeing it. <laughs> There's something to think about. The fact that God's put something in your heart that you're looking for is evidence that you'll be able to see it. Does that make sense? Whatsoever you desire, there's something there that I'm looking for. And how many know that you will, you will see what you're looking for? If you're looking for the bad stuff in people, there'll be somebody to show up and show it to you. Moses is, excuse me, Abraham's taking his son up to the mountain. Where is the, he's probably 16, somewhere 16 to 22 years old, they say. So we're going up there, Dad, where's the offerings that God will provide? We get Jehovah Jireh from that. Abraham is looking all the while, I think, for the sacrifice. If he wasn't looking, he was just saying, but I can't wait till I kill this kid. Then his heart was set on that. When he had him, put him down there, knife was raised, he saw the ram caught in the thicket. God's wanting us to see the end of something, and Proverbs says better is the end of a thing than the very beginning. But when we get locked into the beginning, out of over being overwhelmed, of, of being angry, feel disappointed, shortchanged, we get locked into that, that point of complaining, then we can't move towards the end of the thing because it locks us up right then. There's something about we, we enjoy telling people how bad we think and what somebody did to me. Misery loves company. But... But when you start wanting the company of the Lord, we have to come in his way and do it his way, which is the fact that I'm not talking about misery. I'm talking about the goodness of the Lord. I would have fainted unless I could have seen the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I would have fainted unless I'd seen. God wants us to see what he's doing. He wants us to see where we're heading with that. So tonight... I'm believing that God's going to give you the, the picture to see your way out, what you need to see towards. Because the enemy wants you to accept the way things are. And even psychologists says you need to manage your anger, manage yourself, manage whatever you're at, accept yourself. And I'm not saying you shouldn't accept that. But there comes a point to where... When we lose the ability to dream, the ability for vision, we stop. We're not moving towards it. This is the best it is. Be happy about it. And I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't be content. But he wants us to be able to see what's going on. Second Kings, the sixth chapter. I'll give you a little introduction. Elisha has troubled the Syrians so much that They've come up with a plot. They found out where he was. They encircled where his house was or wherever he was and just circled around. The servant steps out in the morning. You know the story. He looks up and all he sees is the hills surrounded with the Syrians, chariots, horses. 
because he sees what he sees, he responds emotionally and physically by what he sees. How many know if you see something in the natural that you believe it's true, your blood pressure will go up, even if it's not true? Yeah, if something startles you and find out it's not true, you felt something. You felt it physically. And the devil's wanting to cause us to feel or see something that's not necessarily true to cause us to get a physical response or even an emotional response. So finally, he goes in and tells Elisha, look what's going on here, and we're in a jam. What are we going to do? Elisha doesn't seem to be upset, and he said, Father, open his eyes so he can see. So which was real? The Syrians real? Yeah, they were physically real. But remember, before something was visible, there was something invisible before there was the visible. Before you were birthed out of your mother's womb, you were invisible. How they would even say before you were ever a glint in your parents' eyes, you were known by God. If the Lamb of God could be slain from the foundation of the world, before there was ever a world and he was already slain, through the eyes of God, it was already considered done. You still with me? So how, that there's things that God wants to do that's invisible. He's wanting a partnership so we can bring what is in the invisible into the visible world. Poverty, though you may feel it that way, you're one step away from bringing the invisible into the visible world that change everything. The manifestation of healing is the invisible into the visible. Let it be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus evidently had somehow or another that he could see the Father, was in tune with the Father at all times because the only time that he, he could not see the Father was when he's on the cross. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For him was like, if I can't see what God's doing, I feel forsaken. Because God couldn't look upon sin, so he turned his back for just that moment. So God intended for us to have a, the ability to spiritually see, though we're in this world and we're functioning in the natural, there is an invisible world that we can step into. So here's my point with this. Whatever you're believing God for, there is the realm to manifest it, to see it done. And if you can connect into seeing it done at the very end of it, at the, not, not the beginning, but the, see the end at the very beginning, Think how much problem you will save yourself by not worrying. Amen. He could have sent that, that Elisha could have sent a service up there, go, serving them, go up and whip a few of them, see how that turns out. But because there wasn't any concern, so the guys come down to him, and so the Lord prays, God blind them. So here the servant now is seeing that, and the, the enemy is blinded, and he leads the enemy right into, the, into Samaria, and now they become their captives. <clears throat> if we were able to see what God intended for us to see at the very beginning, we would eliminate fear. Job said, that which I feared came on me. If you could eliminate fear out of your diet, out of your thinking, your mindset, your first response, reaction... No, I'm, not all fear is bad. I mean, I have a healthy fear of walking on the train tracks, you know, in the middle of the night with headphones on. You know, I don't know whether it's caution or fear. That which I feared came on me. And the word fear there is, comes from the word torment. So it's another it's a demonic spirit. The average person in the United States lives out of some sort of fear. But we're constantly hearing what's wrong, hearing what's bad. And we got plenty of problems. We got plenty of trouble, plenty to, we could talk about longer on that than anything. But when one sets their heart on fear, they, they behold fear and they become what they are seeing. It's like, don't, don't steer the car over to that tree. Stay away from that tree. Stay away from that tree. Stay away from the tree. And you just right into it. Because that which you're beholding, you became. So to be able to see that, that, we have to clear our spiritual mindsets away from what will be, if 
God didn't show up. That's, that's the, actually a godly imagination to be able to see. We'll talk about that later in the year. So if God wants us to see what the end result would be, that means that I'm praying the end result, not asking God to do the end result. It's already done. It's already completed. What we can't see, he's already seen. If we would believe, when the Bible says, if you believe me, you will see these things. If you believe me. So believe him what? Believe that he existed. Yeah, we believe that you came. But what is he saying? Believe me that I've already seen it. And believe me in what I've seen. And believe what I'm seeing. And now you believe what I'm seeing. And we've come into an agreement. But here's the, here's the issue. We've heard stories growing up. Things that have passed down through our family. Bloodlines. All kinds of things. And we bought in and believed all of the failures and the problems in our life and we've accepted that and now we've believed. We believe in it. And whatever we believe, we find ourselves drawn into. All right, look with me uh, in 2 Corinthians 4. We'll start there. <laughs> if you're still with me. I can back up if we need to. Go another direction. You, got, you guys are meat eaters here anyway, so. If it's not right, Pastor Jason will clean it up when I leave. <laughs> He'll clean up the brain fog. Second Corinthians 4, speaking of verse 16, therefore we do not lose heart. Actually, it's, it's breath, is one of the words it means. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Our spirit man is seeing fresher and fresher day by day, though the outward is getting, you know, older. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. It's one of the reasons we fast. fast fasting weakens the flesh so the spirit is more free to see. We don't fast to get God's attention. The demons don't care whether we eat or not. So it's really fasting is to break our hold and break our, our addictions and break you know, the things that, uh, that are controlling us. Right. For momentary light affliction is working for us a far more great, exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen. And we can stop right there. We do not look at the things which are seen. Well, how can I help it? We don't look at the things that are seen. Now he's putting in the context of the weight of glory. We don't see, look at things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. How do you see what's not seen? It has to be seen through the lens of the Word of God, and the Word of God opens up the glory of God, and out of that causes us to ask and pray according to who His, who his nature, His one nature is. His nature is the Word of God. So if I'm not feeding myself the Word of God, then I'm, I'm creating another lens. There are people that can tell you what's going on in other countries more than they can tell you what's going on in heaven. Tell you more what's reported of that. It's easier, it's easier to do. But to understand what's going on in the heaven, I can take the Word of God and through prayer, spending time in worship, presence of God, I can see all of a sudden there's a peace. God has this thing, and we're moving towards the end of what God says, not the end of what the news channel says. We're all going to get nuked tomorrow. Russia's upset. I have friends that have built bomb shelters and are storing up food. I mean, really. And because they're living in fear. And I said, well, if they're going to nuke me, I want to, be, I want to stand right out in the open. <laughs> to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Amen. I said, I don't want to hang out in a concrete bunker eating old macaroni. <laughs> <laughs> I just couldn't go on right now with Jesus and get that heavenly, heavenly food. 
They just looked at me like, you're, you're crazy. You know, you're just nuts. I'm nuts? <laughs> no, we're not going that way. God's got, God's got, I was messing with them a little bit. Got another plan. I didn't realize their nuclear fear was doing that. But if the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, if we could break that down and saying, your momentary light affliction, whatever that is, had a bad day at work, and that seems to melt us down really quick or upset or focus on something, somebody, somebody done me wrong song. If I realize this is a temporary thing that's trying to block me from seeing the greater glory. When Jesus makes a statement in John the 16th chapter, when he says, um, ask Peter, who do you say that I am? Some say you're a teacher, some say that you're, you're um, a rabbi, some say you're a prophet. He said that you are the son of God. You're the, the Christos. And he says, flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, but my father in heaven. He's telling us right then, there's things that my father in heaven wants to reveal to you but you're listening to what everybody else says. Some say you're a teacher, some say you're a prophet. Let me tell you, there's a lot of prophetic gibberish going on in the world right now. People are building ministries, catching itchy ears, and you know, prophesying things that somebody wants to hear, and they're predicting things or not prophesying things. Prophecy is a proceeding word from God that says, this is the heart of God. This is the end of the thing. This is how things will turn out. And not just predicting who's going to win the election next week. Why don't we just wait and see? We pray towards God's way, but I'm not going to live out of fear of what's going to happen that way. All right. So true prophetic always leads us to the, to the place of the presence of God, how, how God intends for that. So when he said the things that are seen are temporal, so what happens, we get bogged down in the temporal things and it, miss, it causes us to miss the future because I'm, I'm messing up with all the temporary stuff. Your momentary light affliction produces a greater weight of glory because I'm moving through the temporal stuff to get to the eternal things. One of the things that I learned ministering in Africa was that, especially around the, the areas of witchcraft and demonic, was the fact they try to, to intimidate or create fear. If they can create fear inside of you, they disarm you. And they'll say you know, things like, I've, come to, I've killed you, you're on, you're on my land now, and all this kind of stuff. And, and you simply, the earth is Lord's and the fullness thereof. The Bible says, resist the devil and he'll flee. The word resist is translated to replace with. Resist the devil by replacing the word of God with what the devil said, and you move through the temporal into the eternal, because the eternal word is set in eternal. Every time you choose to quote the word, prophesy the word, you step into the eternal because it's settled in heaven forever. When you get bogged down in the temporary, what somebody else says that has no eternal value, you get stuck there. So in order to be able to see the end from the beginning, we have to use eternal things that has ending, ends up, settled in heaven, and by doing that. When you speak fear to one another in the household, you're creating an environment that becomes like a portal or a place for fear and the place for sickness and disease to show up and be around that all that. Not every, all the time, there's other reasons for it. But to create a dominion where there's, there's all this fear going on there, and we use fear sometimes to keep people from doing certain things. If you do this, this will happen to you. Well. One of the words for dominion is to, to put boundaries up. God has boundaries. But his dominion is not for fear, it's to keep out those things. So if we look at the, the point saying, I want to be present with the Lord, you can go into Luke, the fifth chapter, and uh, the Bible says expressly that Jesus was present to heal. Remember that verse? He was present to heal. So much so that they took the roof off and let the guy down there. He was present to heal. That word present didn't mean he just showed up for that. Perusia means the, the very face of God. He's ready to heal. His presence to heal. So when we say presence, we're talking about panea or pane is the face of God with that. 
God wants us to have an encounter with him, an experience with him, so that we see him, and when we see him, everything else we see in the natural becomes less than, not as important at that point. Jesus was present to heal, and we see it again when he comes into Nazareth, he was ready to heal, and they said, is this the son of Joseph? And... uh, Jesus made the statement, though, prophet is not without honor except his own country. And though Jesus was ready to do what he'd done in Capernaum, which was to do miracles, he said he couldn't do many mighty things there. Why? Because they weren't presenced. They weren't there for that. They were, they, all they could see was Jesus. All they could see was him. All they could see was the guy they grew up with. So just for a moment... Just consider what you're believing God to do right now. By the eyes of the Spirit of the Lord, what do you need to see to deliver you out of this present moment to take you into what he wants you to see? So when you see it, you have evidence There's faith there. So just shut your eyes for a minute. By shutting your eyes, you can see more by shutting your eyes than you can see by looking at me. When you shut everything else out, it's amazing how your spirit will begin to speak to you and how reveal things to you and how make things more clear and plain. It's seeing the natural that clouds things. Lord, we just ask for the eyes of the Spirit right now to see what we need to see. The world is clamoring for our attention. It's clamoring to show us something visible. It's clamoring to see, to show us something of a fault and a failure and, and what may happen or not happen to us. So I just pray right now by the Spirit of the Lord, God, that you would help us to see by the Spirit where you want to take us and what you want to do. Once you have a picture of that, you have the evidence that you've partnered with the Spirit of God. And you may have to battle at times to keep maintain what you see in the spirit. The natural is very temporary, but you're going towards the eternal. You're setting a standard of walking out of the the present and setting up the course for the future. With a story where Jacob He's having to face his brother Esau. In his mind, Esau's coming to kill him. He's coming fast. He's coming with this large entourage. Jacob is concerned because he knows that he's, his brother could be angry at him for all the tricksters he's done. And he has this encounter with an angel. And he wakes up and he said, surely the Lord was in this place and I didn't even know it. I was present but I was not cognizant of his presence. One of the greatest things we could ever teach people is how to discern the presence of the Lord. How to walk in the discernment of the presence of the Lord even while your mind may be doing business or dealing with something else, but internally you're, more, you're cognizant of something that's beyond what's happening in the room. The Bible says, walk in the spirit and you'll not fulfill the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh doesn't always just mean sexuality, immorality, or things like that. It just means the things that that are clamoring for the five senses. So to walk in the spirit, how do you, what does that mean to walk in the spirit? It literally just means that I'm moving towards God's, what he showed me, the result is the end thing. 
Can you see yourself delivered right now? You see yourself healed right now? As soon as you have a revelation, you see it. He manifests himself that way. The, manif- the word manifest means to unveil in a very, very present tense. Ephesians 1.18, it's an apostolic prayer. Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your understanding would be able to see, not the eyes of your head, understanding your spirit. Eyes of your understanding would be able to see what is the hope of your calling in Christ Jesus. I pray that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. The word enlightened there is the word photizo. We get the word photograph from. So it would read, I pray that the eyes of your understanding would take a picture. What is the hope of the glory, the expectation, the riches? That means what God calls wealth of who he is, his wealth of his glory, in the inheritance of the saints. It's your inheritance. It belongs to you. But to pull it out of the invisible into the visible is the issue. How do we do that? It is breakthrough. You have to break through. Lay down everything that you've held on to that's given you a reason to be angry. Lay down every right and every right fighter, because we can fight to be right, that we've held on to that's given us a reason to feel the what we've done. Isaiah 6. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Was he in a vision? Was really happening? The temple was filled with the glory of the Lord. He was using it a natural, but there was also this prophetically declaring. Pastor Gary and I enjoy talking about this that we are te- that we we became a temple. We're a temple. So now the glory of the Lord has filled the temple. He is seeing something that's prophetically out in the future because it was no longer in the temple. Now it became Holy Spirit not only in you but now with you but now in you. We're now carriers of the glory of God. So if I'm Adam and Eve before the fall, they they saw everything through the lens of glory. So what is he doing? He's restoring us back to where we're seeing things through the eyes of glory, not through the eyes of suspicion, the eyes of doubt, the eyes of unbelief. What if? How come? You can get stuck by asking God why and never get an answer. Stuck there for 20 years asking God why. I, don't, I haven't found any place in Scripture, I may be wrong, where God answered a why question, but I do see that he answers a how and a who question. Getting, if we've, we've done all these great things and all these promises you've given our Father, then how come? How come these Amorites are coming here and afflicting us? We've all these promises you've how come it's happening this way? And the angel doesn't tell him why. He tells him, go and deliver them. In other words, he's trying to get us to move towards the end result instead of not being stuck with the why. How come? Look at me. I'm the victim. And the more I feel victimized, the more I can't see the glory of God. So tonight I'm believing the Lord to set some of us just free, all of us. Set us free. Doubt and unbelief. When Jesus was there in the boat and the storm comes up, and he said, oh, how little faith, how unbelief, you're operating in such, oh, you have little faith. Well, to to have unbelief, you have to have belief to undo it. I believe, Lord, but there's things working against me that it keeps undoing what I believe you're doing. So God wants to set us free from that so we can see what he's seeing. Corinthians, Paul said, one looks into a mirror, they become, whatever the image that they're seeing there, they become transformed, metamorphosis into the image they're seeing. If God can change what we're seeing, he can change everything about our lives. If he can change what you believe about yourself, the negative, then he can transform everything around you. Otherwise, I read the Bible that it's good for somebody else, but it's not me. 
It's, the, it's simply theoretical if I don't take it to mean me. So, Father, we just look to you, the author and the finisher of our faith. And we pray and ask you tonight, O oh God, that you would come in such a way that remove the scales from our eyes, remove us from seeing the things that this world has put before us and made us feel the way it did. And we want to step in to the presence place of your anointing right now. God, we want a chronos moment, though we're in a, a, a kairos season. The sons of Issachar knew the times and seasons, but knew what to do. God, we want to know that we understand times and seasons, but we need to know what to do, how to respond, how to react to that. So we know number one thing is that I'm not to react to fear or react to losing or react to being defeated because that's not of your nature. So I come in to whatsoever I ask has your nature, your, your divine nature involved. So I'm asking according to your nature who you are. And you said whatever would ask the Father in your name or your nature, word of God, it would be done. So I pray right now that you would plant seed in the hearts of people that would begin to extend beyond the moment and help us to see. There's things that I've seen for our, our country, our nation, that I'm holding in my heart, believing God for. That's why I don't get too disturbed about a lot of those things. I'm around intercessors that they're they're cursing politicians and calling around names and everything on the sun. And I said, the devil's just enjoying your conversation. No, we're, we're, not, we're not putting up with this. I said, and Jesus said, my kingdom's not of this world lest my servants would be fighting here. So if you're fighting here, and I believe in spiritual warfare, and you're fighting flesh against flesh, then you're fighting here and you're not fighting from the kingdom position. Let your kingdom come here. So fight from there to here, not from here, trying to get him to come down. No, he said, you come up. And when you fight from that position, you see exactly how it's going to be. But when you're angry at a politician, you're angry at another person, it's flesh on flesh. And nothing is ever accomplished about that. Because all these politicians are, being, are puppets being pulled strings by demonic spirits and principalities and power. So therefore, he says his kingdom is of that of realm. So all the enemy wants to do is get us so fixated on what's happening here around us and what you don't have and what you're not getting and that and to where you're locked in. Come up hither. Come up higher. We're seated with him. Three seats the Bible talks about. Psalms 1, or those who uh, says don't sit in the seat of the scornful, those who despise the things of God, who mock them, make fun of them. Ephesians 2 is a, being seated with him in heaven and places. Then in Revelations, he talks about where Satan's seat is. I know where Satan's seat is. The seat that he's talking is, is to be able to come into a spiritual relationship and fellowship with him that out of that resists the evil. Going back to Matthew 16. One of the words he used for Hades, the gates of hell, Hades, Hadassah, means to block light or block revelation. So when Jesus said, I give you the keys or the authority, the right to, and said by the gates of hell will not prevail, meaning the fact is I'm giving you the right to push back anything that blocks the light or the revelation of what I'm calling you to do. But hell has to open up to you. When a man's ways please the Lord, he'll even cause his enemies to be at peace with him. So first of all, he says, I want you to download joy so you can be anointed with the oil of joy. And with the oil of joy, you're, you find a place with God. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. So with faith, that means we're pleasing God. So when our ways please the Lord, and the word Ways there is the word direct, D-E-H-R-E-K, which means your thoughts and your actions, thoughts and actions. 
When your ways please the Lord, he'll cause your enemies to be at peace with you. In other words, nothing can resist what you're going to do. To walk in such a way that you could walk right through hell and they can't stop you. I, I've literally been in churches where, uh, usually overseas, but I've one church here in the U.S., in Texas, by the way, that literally, while I was preaching, there was, I could hear screeching. And it wasn't in my spirit, I could phys- hear them naturally, and other people were hearing them. Because the joy of the Lord literally causes the enemy to be, drives them crazy. So in such a way that you're not going to lose, because I know what I, I got a picture. I believe it's the Lord, so therefore I'm operating in faith, not letting anything dissuade me, but at the eyes of the Spirit, I see what's going to happen. And they'll just scream at you and holler and raise every kind of obstruction to you. And you don't stop and have conversation because your face is set. When Jesus was going into Jerusalem, Peter tries to stop him and said, Lord, if you go into Jerusalem, they're going to kill you, as if he didn't know. And he says to his friend, get behind me, Satan, for you do not have a taste for the things of God. You don't have a sense of things of God. Peter had an ulterior motive. He did not want Jesus to be killed because as long as Jesus was hanging around, our taxes were paid. Let's just go fishing. We're not hungry. You hang out with Jesus and you can take home leftovers. You can take a doggy bags home. You got baskets full left on purpose. You can just take them home. Peter realized that hanging out with Jesus that they started recognizing Peter. He was, he was now part of the entourage. It was cool hanging out with Jesus. You'd have to have more than one boat to go fishing because he'd sink your boat. So Peter had in his mind who Jesus was, but he didn't realize the way he was going to go. He did not, he was offended with Jesus. He was thinking Jesus came to kick out the Romans, get rid of the Romans, Messiah comes, he will establish your kingdom here and I'll be your next in command. There's a lot of people join in ministry because they're looking for a position. Not in that kingdom, but in this kingdom. And they're disappointed when it doesn't happen the way they didn't. They didn't promote me in church or they didn't recognize my gifting. The Bible says promotion doesn't come to the east to west, comes by the Lord. Talk to him. Don't blame me. God had you invisible for the time, just be happy over it. Because as soon as you're unveiled, that's when you become a target. There's times when the Lord just unveils himself and just sees how we'll react to it and respond. At that moment when he comes into the room and we're so easily distracted, that's a test to see how are we going to be a host for him? How are we going to be presenced in his presence? I think that's where the church world is right now. We're being tested. We're praying for revival and revival is present but we haven't released revival. Because oh, yeah. revival's in us. Amen. Doesn't come with an evangelist. Because revival, resuscitation means simply the breath of God, or Him breathing through us, and we just allow Him to be manifested, Lord. unveiled. Revival could start tonight. Amen. If every one of us had the courage to lay down self and just to let God arise. Psalm 68, let his enemies be scattered. So we think revival is something that's on God's chronology, you know, like a special revival. I think there are times it happens that way. This may sound a little strange, but I have revival with the Lord daily. Not the kind of revival of hoot and a holler, but he's reviving me. I feel him breathing into my spirit. Jesus comes in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's asking his disciples, there the weight of the world is upon him. His capillaries are breaking open. We think then he's just sweating blood. 
Can you imagine his disciples seeing him? I've never seen you bloody like that. He's sweating drops of blood, and they're asleep. And he said, can you not tarry with me one hour? One hour. Just. They were present. And he finally recognized, yeah, I know you're tired, and just go ahead and sleep. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Here's my point with this. To see what we need to see, we have to be willing to lay down the inconvenience of time, energy, space, whatever it might be, to be presenced with him. Well, I'm just too tired. I'm, it's not convenient for me. You can look at Song of Solomon. It's a great story. She's come. She's taken off. You know, she's... she's done up, got all the oils running up and down her. She's done up, do, got the dew for the day. And then he comes and knocks on the door, the lover of her soul. And she said, it's not convenient. Finally, she recognized he's not waiting. And she puts her hand on the door, dripping with oil, and, and he's not there. And then she runs out, where's my beloved? There's a timing when the Holy Spirit is among us and on us presently, I think it's a daily thing if you're if you willing to go there, and recognize he's in the room Amen. and not be distracted by it, by everything else. We'll have Martha's with us. Will we get distracted by what, how people are dressed, what they look like, what they are, whether we've ever seen them before and we're distracted. I wonder what they want. I wonder what they're thinking. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. I can't believe they were in that, they were in that at the church. Whoa. In my day, we would have never, I would have never had a conversation with a lady. I said, well, in your day, your hair was piled up and your dress was past your ankles. And yet Jesus still came. And they moved their dresses up to their, their knees and Jesus still showed up. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about being immodest. But the distractions, we have Mary chose the better part. Martha, you're encumbered with so many other things. So part of the ability to see what he wants to do with us individually, collectively, is how we get through all of the distractions. Distractions is losing traction. You get stuck. I was going good and somebody moved my cheese. Which is a book you'd have to read. Something, I was going good till somebody did something. I was going good. My husband and wife just quit going to church. Well, we stand before the Lord individually, not on the family plan. So as you continually break through all of the resistance, all of the barriers, all of the excuses, all of the reasons why, and you enter into that, you are, you are now with a position to where that whatever you overcome, you have now authority over it. So we're going to have times where it's going to be inconvenience, the times we don't feel like it. A lot of times, you know, I mean, I don't, en I don't enjoy getting on another plane in a couple of days and just doing, going again and again. Once I get there and I feel the anointing, I'm great. But in between times, but I know I'm supposed to. So when you respond to what you know to do, then somehow or another he opens the next thing and the next level, next thing. So tonight, I, I pray the Holy Spirit would show us the things that we have to break through. Amen. I want to tell you this story, and then I'm going to start ministering. I know I, I probably, more than likely, shared this story before, just to let you know that I probably have, so you don't think that I'm losing <laughs> myself here a little bit. It's a friend of mine, John Garlington, Joseph, Joseph Garlington, his brother. I just started out in ministries in my 20s. John Garlington was a he took me under his wing, and he's, he was helping me. He was sitting at the kitchen table, and he said, Carrie, do you know what breakthrough is? So I said, well, I think there's a verse in Micah. At that time, I was just hoping I could find the book of Micah, <laughs> you know, about a breaker anointing. He said, no, that's, there's a verse there, but that's not what I'm talking about. He said, let me explain it. He pastored a large church in Portland, Oregon. 
friend of his who pastored across town called him up and says, John, you've been stealing my sheep. And John said, well, I don't own any sheep. He said, yeah, I've got people been leaving my church, coming over to your church. You've been stealing my sheep. They were friends. He said, no, I don't know. I mean, he didn't know who's coming. And all. His church is you know, a couple thousand, so he didn't know who was who. So he, all of a sudden he had this vision. He's told his friend, he said, but I can tell you what your problem is. He said, please tell me. He said, I had this vision. I said, you got a hole. He said, I, you have a hole in your fence, and your sheep have been crawling through the hole, getting on my side, eating the green grass, and they get too fat to get back through the hole. <laughs> he said, that, my friend, is breakthrough. <laughs> when you go through something, I may just. I'm dead. <laughs> when you go through something and you overcome it and you don't go back through what you just came through, you now have had breakthrough. And whatever you break through, you have ownership and you have authority and you own that to where it's deposited in your name. So tonight the Lord gives us opportunities to break through. If you're easily offended, that's a hole you need to crawl through and never go back again. That's right. And the enemy will test you and test you and test you until you're no longer offendable. Blessed are the unoffendables. <laughs> they will not be broken. But if we're easily offended, it's amazing how everything offends you. Somebody said something and it offended you. To the point is that you get so focused and your affection is set upon the Lord so much so that you're no longer bothered. You can't even, you don't even know that they even took it that way is because you're just wearing Teflon. It just doesn't stick. <laughs> so Father, we just want to crawl through that and never get back through there again. Help us to outgrow things that have set us off in the past. And it's usually things that we feel about ourselves, we feel negative about ourselves, we bought into a lie, and the enemy knows exactly who to send, what to send, to say something that's related to that lie. Tonight we've come to the throne of grace to get help so we never go back that way again. And I thank you for the infilling and the infusion of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm probably not. That's fine. I'll just, I'll just use this. Fine. Amen. What's your name? Olivia. Olivia, you step out, please. I hear the Holy Spirit saying, I'm rewriting chapters in your life that's going to be more like poetry than something that was said about you in your past files. I'm tearing up some old files that it's like the enemy is trying to make you feel like you're living down. And tonight the Holy Spirit is saying, I want those things to pass away. Don't go back and visit them. They're dead. They have no power, any dominion over you. And when the enemy comes in to try to remind you of that, you remind them that Jesus is Lord. From this night on, I release inside of you a enlarging of the capacity of the Holy Spirit inside of you, that stretching from one end to the other, the Holy Spirit is going to fill you so much to the point that it's going to have an effect on other people's lives. There's an evangelistic anointing on you. I'm not talking about a five-fold evangelist, but a, an a influencer that you are. You carry influence with you. And I'm going to put you around people that you'll have influence. And these are people who've sat in darkness and people that have been in that kind of place. And you've come out of that. And because you've come out of that, you've had a break out of that. And now the Lord is saying, I've given you authority that you can now deliver those who sit in darkness. Even to the point of giving you discernment, giving you the word of, a word of pro prophetic word to speak over them that will set the captives free. 
be like the woman at the well that Jesus had the encounter with. And she went back and tell everybody, come and see a man who told me all manners of things. And she gathered people that she wouldn't have anything to do with before. So I don't know what you do for a living, but there's something about when you touch, touching people, there's going to be a transfer of the presence of God upon you, that you're more than what you think you are. You're not marked. You're not damaged goods. There's no marks there. There's nothing that will mark you from any point in time in your life that right now the blood of Jesus is coursing through your life in a very powerful way. I release over you this anointing to set captives free, to bring people out of darkness by the power of the authority of Jesus. I release inside of you this, conf this confidence and authority of the Spirit of God that you know that you know that you could walk right in the middle of hell and bring them out, bring them out. The fear of demonic is being lifted off of you. Amen. The fear of the enemy, which has had you captured at times of the past, tonight the Lord is breaking that thing off of you. You will not fear what the enemy can do at all. They're all threats and they're all lies, and he has no place of that. In the name of Jesus, I release that footprint, that place. Give no place to the devil, he's saying. Ephesians 4.30. I remove that footprint where the enemy has come in and out and commanded to be broken off of you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, uh, you know. so, what, what's your name, man? Yes, Victoria. I hear the Holy Spirit saying, you're going to be able to declare the thing that you're wanting to to see done. I'm putting inside of you a confidence that whatever you say that has been already said by the Word of God, that you're going to recognize that it's not just your words, but it comes up before the Lord of Sabaoth. I see golden bowls in heaven that you've just been praying and praying and praying and praying. And the Lord wants you to know that according to the Word of God, it, they're filling up, even in your behalf, and something is beginning to tip. There is a tipping point, tipping your way, heading your way. And tonight, the Lord is, is delivering you from the fear of failure or the fear of, not, of incompletion. I don't know how it's described as like, there's so many loose ends, and don't think they're all being tied up, and, you know, and I, there's so many things I don't wish to grab a hold. Does that make sense to you? All right, tonight, don't you lift your hands right before the Lord. I, I command this, this feeling of incomplete. Nothing seems to ever get done. There's so many loose ends and something just always haven't got enough. And you go through and say, I didn't get anything done today. And this feeling like non-productive idea and mindset. In the name of Jesus, I release you from this sense of failure a sense of failing to complete, a, a sense of failure of finishing. I would release the finishing anointing upon you tonight to see something completed and finished and done, and it's all wrapped up with a bow. It is done. It is completed. And there's some family members that the Lord said there's going to be a completion with them as well, that your prayers have not gone in vain. You'll see them breaking through fully in Jesus' name. You're stronger than what you think. You're stronger than what you think. I'm removing out of your vocabulary, I can't see myself doing that. Begin to see yourself doing that. He wants you to start seeing yourself doing that beyond what you thought you could do. Jesus, amen, amen. Hallelujah. What's your name? Austin. You guys together? Well, well, I should figure that out. Now I just had lunch with you and didn't even know. You're all starting to look alike now. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to enlarge the boundaries that you've set for yourself. I'm going to move the stakes out farther. Pick up, pull up the pinched pent, tent pegs and to extend and expand beyond what you thought you could do. You carry more of the, an understanding of the grace of God than what you know. There's times you thought, 
you know, I'm just not that spiritual. I'm, this is who I am, and I just, I'm okay with that. And other people don't need to be spiritual. And you said, I, I come from more of a common sense. The Lord wants to bring you more into a supernatural sense. I want to stir up something inside of you because you're fearfully and wonderfully made. You are made supernaturally. And I want to start having you think outside of the box what has been the natural realm and cause you to begin to think, possibly. Maybe, God, you're operating inside and outside of that realm no more. So I just stir up inside of you to begin to think in terms of what is impossible. And even the Lord to give you a desire that's beyond your ability to see it happen and his ability to make it happen. So, Father, I just pray over Austin right now, God, that you would expand and extend his capacities for understanding the things of the Spirit of God and believing you for the impossible, believing you outside of the realms of that. And I'm not saying you, you don't have belief, but it almost scares you when you get stepped out a little farther than that. You're more spiritual than what you know. I've, God's created you to be a spiritual person. Somewhere in the background, you saw things that were flaky and something that happened that made you kind of pull, pull the, the side pegs in and protect yourself. And the Lord is saying, if you'll trust him and keep you from all the craziest out there, for everything that's weird, it means it's simply a, co a counterfeit to the reality. And all the seeing the weird stuff has kept you from really the reality of the power and might of God from that. So God is wanting to unveil himself to you in a spiritual way. So Lord, I pray for Austin. God, that you would give him dreams while he's asleep. Proverbs 16, I mean, Psalm 16 says, while you're asleep, the Spirit of the Lord communes with you. God, I'm asking personally that you would speak to him while he's asleep in such a way that his spirit would connect with it when his mind doesn't have a way to interrupt or disrupt or try to talk him out of that. You're going to be starting having a sensitivity of the Spirit of the Lord. I just release this prophetic bent that God gave you a long time ago. And what has been an ember burning there, but now it's time. The Lord is saying, blowing on those embers and cause the fire of God to burn again, again. I've not called you to manage the fire. I'll take care of the fire. I'm just looking for a, a fireplace to put the fire in. I will be responsible for the wood. I'll be responsible for the power. I'll be responsible for all that. I'm looking for a place that I can release the fire of the Holy Spirit in. And by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, I stir up the gift of God, that word of knowledge and wisdom that you carried as such a young girl, and that word that gave you a sense of, that you understood exactly what God wanted to do at all time. I just stir that up, dust off the cares of life, and bring this to the surface of, God, you do say, you do speak. I'm removing the trying to talk yourself out of when God says something. It's like God prompts you and then you, your mind kicks in and tries to tell you why you shouldn't believe that. I am stirring that once again. I, the gifts and calling of God, I don't change my mind with it. But with this gifting, you'll be able to go farther with it because I'm going to let you both have the supernatural mixed in with the natural. So when you're operating in the natural, people will recognize there's something supernaturally happening to you. And to stir up the heart of God upon this. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. You're okay with her getting the fire gun on her? Okay. You're not going to dampen it for her or anything? Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. I want to take, I want to pray over you both of you this way. In the name of Jesus. God, I just, I just call those things that are not as though they are right now. To stir this grace and anointing, the yoking of the fellowship of the Spirit in Christ Jesus. I see the two of you, and you may already be doing this. I see you praying together, and you've got a journal, and you're writing down things that you pray together because a threefold cord is not easily broken. The two of you praying is much stronger than if I was praying with you because of the divine connection. And as you started writing things down, you, you saw each other taking turns praying. Don't say that she's a better prayer than you are because... God's not looking for fancy prayers. He's looking for hearts. 
And as you write these things, we pray over this, we prayed over this, prayed over this. And you'll go back and you'll start seeing what you prayed and you check it off. It's done, done, done. So for the father who sees in secret is going to reward you openly. Jesus, Jesus. God, I, I just... This, I just call the time issue. They're, they're fighting for time. It just seems like time gets in the way of everything they do. I just call, I break this hold of time over them where it's divided them and kept them just operating in the natural but not bonded to, together. In Jesus' name, I would take a look at the schedule and say, God, are you pleased with the schedule? Scheduling. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You guys together? Yep. yep. You sound like you're from Texas, man. I like that. Yep. <laughs> Believe God for things beyond your ability to see. I'm going. I want to stir you up to move into the heavenly realm and begin to pray what you see by the Spirit. It's like I've been preaching that. Begin to pray by the Spirit. Not what your ability can do. What, not even praying what you think you deserve, but what the Lord wants desiring for you. Whatsoever you desire, when you pray, believe you have. And the word desire means to lean towards, towards the wind. Let him lift you up. He's going to give you a desire, not just for stuff for yourself, but he's going to give you a desire for something that you're going to do in the community with youth. I just stir this up right now, God, that your support system are going to have something to do connecting with youth, that you're going to pour into a generation. He's going to sow into that. And by sowing into this to a generation, then God said, I'm I'll, going I'll to sow into you. The very thing that you want for yourselves, you're going to sow it into somewhere else by giving yourself of your time. I don't know what's, what could be done in this community with the youth, but, well, Justin could tell you. Anyway, there's something about a partnership the Lord wants you to do so that your, your eyes are lifted off of what about us and just taking care of us. And when you begin to do that, you're going to, be, you're going to do incredible things among that point. All right. I release and for you the gifting. I don't know if you've ever thought of this. The gift of a teacher. I stir this up inside him right now. The ability to communicate the word of God. To transfer information into one person or the other. That your life will be a teaching. A, a ability to communicate. Ability to show follow me as I follow Christ thing. And so the Lord is stirring that up inside of you. That it's not, it's not enough anymore just to come and show up. But the Lord said, I have need of you. I am untying you like the colt that Jesus rode inside of Jerusalem with. I am untying you from where you've been tied up. And now he says, I want to come upon you and I want to take you into the very center of what I'm doing. You will not be an observer of the kingdom of God. You're going to be right in the middle of what I'm doing. I want to bring you right into the center of what I'm doing. Never saw it, you've never thought about yourself having a ministry. Everybody has that. But he's going to unveil it in such a way that it's no longer about, uh, if I do this, this is what I'll get out of it. You're going to sow away from yourselves. And by doing that, you're going to see something begin to come back to you. Cast your bread on the water, and it's going to come back to you. But it's going to have to cast it to see it coming back. Where's Nikki? There she is. Stand, Nikki. I didn't know that was your sister. I, should, I could look and see that. I call you into being territorial. Mark the territory as an intercessor. Begin to, even around the city, footprints for the kingdom of God. I'm laying out footprints even in such a way that you're putting boundaries 
around these area of the city and say, I refuse drug dealers. I refuse the kingdom of darkness to come into this area. I'm putting boundaries I have a right to. I'm declaring it to be done. And by doing that, you will establish a realm of the spirit of God, even as a ring of fire around the county that the enemy will not be able to encroach. Even so much so, they'll, they'll see even the statistics and all of the issues going on in the county will begin to change and go down because one was standing in the gap between heaven and earth and saying, give them back, give them back, restore, restore, so that I call your, your words before the Lord. And even as the scripture says, of my hands, command you me. That essentially means it's in my hand, join hands with my hands, and commanding means that I've already given you right to, to exercise my hands in response to that. Lord, I just pray for the faith and the boldness and the confidence of the Holy Spirit to even to say what's on your heart. There'll be an opportunity that you're going to go before some leaders and be able to say, this is what our city is. This is what we need. This is how, what we need. To, and you will plead the case, not just for the church, but plead the case for citizens, for people. And standing before those in authority, because God's given you the boldness and the confidence not to back down, but you, do, you have a voice, an ambassador to speak under the influence of the Holy Spirit. I release that prophetic trumpet within your mouth and heart. When other people say it can't be done, there's something rises up within you like a, like a Joshua and Caleb saying, we can do this, we can do this. When everybody else says, we can't do this or something, you said, we can do it, we can do it. This is my mount. We can do it. I've marked it, taken I've seen it, and so it belongs to the Lord, and so we're not going to back up from that. Your voice is breaking through all of the doubt and unbelief because of the confidence of the Holy Spirit. I just I stir that gift of God up inside of you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Just a couple right here. Yes, sir. Yes, you step out here. Oh. I hear the Holy Spirit saying that God's given you a spirit of wisdom, not for you just to have information, but to have an understanding of what to do. Not having knowledge for the sense of having just knowledge because you can be a brainiac and it'll just cripple you. You can be, a, you can be a, just all full of knowledge and eat at the tree of knowledge of good and evil and never get life on it. But the Lord is saying, I'm giving you a spirit of wisdom and understanding to know how to be able to fix problems and issues. You're going to speak back into problems and issues and have a voice to be able to speak into those things and saying, this is, the, this is what God's saying. It's not an opinion. It's not even by your experience. It's by a sense of knowing in your heart that God is putting this inside of you. At one point in time, you felt that you had something and, and it wasn't received. And the Lord is saying, that's never going to happen again. I'm giving you a voice. Something happened that shut you down, that called you, said, I'm never going to put myself out there. You don't, you don't understand what I'm saying. I'm never going to put myself out there because it's just better to keep my mouth shut, my head down, because I was judged for something, and rightfully so. And the Lord is saying to you, I'm removing that stigma. I'm removing that even as a good excuse as it was for that time. The Lord has said, I'm bringing you out of hiding and I'm bringing light and life on you, not to give your opinion, but to hear the Lord and knowing how to respond, the times and seasons, but know what to do. I'm removing the fear of being wrongly judged tonight, right now. Never go back there again. Never feeling I was rejected by that. There's a group of people like you felt the rejection, felt you were judged and voted on and somehow or another it just the vote didn't go your way sounds strange as it is and the Lord is saying I wasn't in on that vote and I didn't vote that way and so don't think about their vote, it, that their votes don't count it's what he says to you 
Lord, I'm bringing him from the back to the front because you're in test, you're trusting him. There's a release of the integrity of the Lord inside of you. In Jesus' name. There's healing coming to you right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. When, he, when you are weak, he is strong. You felt that your weakness was a, was a detriment, but it's, it's really your strength. Because you've come before the Lord in your weakness and, and is allowing him to bring the time of humility. But the lessons of humility are over. Now it's the times of moving in the confidence of the Holy Spirit. The fear of others, other people's words are being broken off of you tonight. The fear of man is a snare, but the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So tonight I release the wisdom of God, not the fear of mankind. Jesus. It's like a protection. Just I want to be protected. So God is your protector. He's your shield and your buckler. If you trust him once again, then he, he will release inside of the things that he's been saying to you, wanting to do through you and with you. Your best, is, your best days are ahead. Your best days are ahead. Whatever happened in the past was not the best days. But I'm bringing you out of that. And it, I can tell you, it will not come a second time. It will not come at you a second time. I cut the ties to that moment in time that created a pain and just release it right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You guys still with me? Present. Present. <laughs> present or present? Presence. Oh, presence. Okay. I'm present. That's all I'm saying for that. Um, you guys always get left out on this the wingman over here. Hallelujah. Can you stand up without being? Yes. What's your name? Ashley. Ashley. Have I prophesied over you before? Yes. Or I know a number of Ashleys. So. <laughs> you understand the realms of miracles. You've seen, you've tasted and you've seen. And because of that, the Lord's going to cause you to have the gift of miracles in your own heart, in your own hands. Right when I touched you, I heard the Lord saying, I will extend myself through her because she walked through a season where she trusted me. And you passed the test and the Lord said, well done, daughter. Well done. I found great pleasure being with you and around you. And your home has become a sanctuary of my peace and my rest. And my joy belongs to you. Therefore, the Lord is saying to you, think it won't be a strange thing when people come to you with issues that seem so insurmountable and things so strange. But somehow or another, without taking in all the information, you'll say, let's pray. Let's pray. For I've put within your mouth the word of faith, just not by, by saying it, but literally you, you, you carry as a temple, faith inside the temple. So that as if when people come into the house of God, the temple, they say glory. That glory is a shout inside of you that wherever you go, something happens and is transformative. And the Lord is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And because you have led graciously, and you've not charged God foolishly. And you've not blamed God for those, anything. The Lord says, I found great favor upon you. And I'm, I'm going to cause a, a tremendous reward to come. A redemptiveness of the Lord God that will give you things that you never asked for. That will give you handfuls on purpose. Because you walked through even the valley and trusted him to get you to the top of the mountain. So, God, I speak over her right now. Ash Ashley, right? Mm -hmm. I speak over Ashley 
a fullness and a fulfillment of what you're doing and saying. You're setting her up for the days ahead to see the might and the power of God. There's people that have authority, but then there's people that have authority and power. You not only have authority by position of the word, but you have power by reason of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So I just release inside of you the power of the Holy Spirit to carry out the work that you've been given authority to do. I just anoint you. I don't know if you go into a classroom or where you go. But I just, in the cla- when you go into a classroom, the, I just see the peace and presence of God on you to where it's transferable to some young ones. And in the classroom, you're more than just teaching information. You are carrying the glory of God that goes into other families, other mothers, and other people that are in abusive situations, in hurtful situations, and yet you're a healer. You're a steward of the little ones. You're a steward of the manifold grace of God. And so I hear him saying, I fill the classroom up with the glory. You are a carrier of the glory, and you fill that room. And even when people, they come to pick their kids up, there's a transfer of the glory of God. There's still the essence of his presence, pre-essence, the essence of who he is, lingers there. Hallelujah. I don't know what you do, but I sure like to hang around now. If you're a hairdresser, I mean, that's, that's good too. <laughs> Hallelujah. What's your name? Yeah. Huh? Carrie. Wow, I've heard that before. <laughs> step out. <laughs> Carrie, do you step out here? Yeah. I felt all night long you were saying, God, I hope he gives me a word. <laughs> I mean, a lot of you would. I hear the Holy Spirit saying, tonight I'm breaking off of you the fear of what was so you can enter into what can be. I just break off of you right now the shackles where the enemy has beat you up with bad decisions, wrong decisions, about something about decisions to where it even caused you to make you to even second guess any decision. And so now the point you come to where it's almost that you're at indecision because I'm afraid to make another wrong decision. So I just release you of the fear of moving in a wrong direction, the fear of missing out, the fear of, of not being able to see the fulfillment of what you expected. Father, in Jesus' name, just command the enemy to loose from her right now. There's just something going with your mind. It's, especially when you lay down at night, it's like your mind just starts running in so many directions, replaying old recordings in the name of Jesus. I sever those old tapes. I cut them loose from her. They can't replay. I muzzle this spirit that, has, that speaks to her and brings accusation against you. I break the spirit of accusation that even causes you to be an accuser. I break that, that you'll not accuse or even make accusation. I sever that, that cycle in Jesus' name. Be set free completely in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen, amen. What's your name right, right here? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, the Kleenex person. I don't know if there's a calling for that, but you do it well. Can you step out here? People enjoy speaking to you because you're easy to talk to. Because they feel like they can just tell you anything and they trust you with what they're saying. And the Lord has two things. Number one is be careful for what they say to you that you don't become the garbage pot for them to empty their stuff out on. So they're not just calling you up and saying, have you heard the latest? You'll have to discern whether it's something that God wants you to hear or know or not. If he doesn't want you to know, you'll simply say, well, let me just pray right now. And just cut it short. But there is, the Bible says, 
about a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And it's through your friendliness that the Lord is saying, I want you to declare the testimony of the Lord. Begin to, your conversations are going to be about the things of God more than about anything else. You're going to be able to share. The Lord said to me, God said to me, I felt this. I woke up this morning and God said that. And you're just going to be able to start being a sower of truth, a sower of light, and the sower of the glory of the Lord. And it's going to attract the right people. The people that it shouldn't attract, they don't want to hear it, they'll, you'll repel them. You may cut down on the number of people that's pouring into the, the garbage pot, but, but you're going you're to have much freedom with that. But you're going to help bring people into the knowledge of the Son of God. I see people that are steeped in tradition, that religiosity, and they're going to re they're, they're recognize something on you. There's freedom and liberty that you have, and you'll say, well, let me tell you about it. The law of liberty in Christ Jesus set me free from the law of sin and death. And the liberty that will operate in you will help set them free and bring them into liberty. You'll be a, a, a carrier of his presence and be able to break them out of the jails, the, the religious jails, and bring them into the kingdom of God. So, Lord, I just call her into her place right now. That she would have words of life and spirit. Every time she comes in contact with someone, that's, she begins to see here's an opportunity. There's a reason why I'm doing this. There's a reason why I'm with them. And help me to see it and take it advantage of all the opportunities that you bring me in. The things that seem so casual before are going to seem like divine connections now. For he's sending you. You're not just going. He's sending you. Start looking for the designated opportunities of what God's wanting to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. If, you're, if you um, have some decisions and you're facing something and you need some wisdom, I want you to stand up. I don't know how else to explain it other than that. There's something that you need to, to decide on. And you need, you need some answers for them. Stand up. <laughs> All right. So lay hands on yourself right now. I'm going to pray. Lord, I pray that these people standing would be able to see the unseen. And you would drop inside of them, God, pictures of what need to happen and things that need to step into and decisions that need to make. That they would be confident and bold to be able to do it. And they, that you would show them clearly what they should do. They would see it so perfectly that they would like know the right people, the right who to call, what not to do, and what to do. And that they do it with such a confidence of the Holy Spirit that they would operate in that level. From this night on, that they will be unstuck be not static, stuck in one position, that you would move them into the next season with liberty. Move them into the next season with confidence. And I just remove all of the issues of complaining, all of the issues that is keeping you stuck there, and just hit the play button, not the pause button, and to move through by the Spirit of the Lord. Give them eyes to see, Lord, what they need to see in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right.